he does seem to be you know at least some to some degree an originalist and he expressed some yeah. commitment to originalism in his confirmation hearings talked about original public meaning things yeah, he like said that he's a, he's a public meaning originalist yeah. right which is interesting because we as we talk about in the show I'm not sure i'd ever heard himself describe him that way himself I, that way i'm before. not sure he had ever explicitly said i am an originalist and, yeah. and, and you know will bode who's sort of a leading academic advocate of originalism, who was our guest uh, a few weeks ago, said he wasn't sure if, if, if Judge Kavanaugh was originalist. Would, you, would use the label, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so the reason that this is important is because I think that criminal law, and especially constitutional criminal procedure, is the area where a commitment to originalism is, is supposed to kind of most cash out in um, what you might call like a like anti-partisan ways, right? Mm -hmm. So like Justice Scalia, the last few years on the, he was on the court, he really you know, kind of was involved in multiple pro-defendant revolutions in criminal procedure and everything from the Fourth Amendment to Crawford to of course sentencing and things like that. Uh, and so that's quite significant if you're looking at this court and you're asking, well, is this person gonna be sort of an Alito style uh, conservative on the court or is he gonna be a Scalia and maybe Gorsuch style conservative on the court? Well, for a lot of things, those are the same, right? Those people vote together in a lot of cases. In, outside the criminal context. Outside the criminal right? context, yeah. right? Yeah. But in, in the criminal procedure and criminal law context, uh, those are quite different uh, things to get. And so, um, you know, we'll see. Um, but I thought that that was a significant, you, you know, in other words, if he's going to be engaging with originalist arguments on, you know, the meaning of, you know, the excessive fines clause, for example, which we'll talk about later uh, in the discussion, uh, that's, that's really important. Uh, and it's very important. Yeah, and it could actually push the court a little bit to the left on some discrete issues where Justice Kennedy was not on the sort of pro-defendant team, like yeah. the confrontation clause he and uh, the Apprendi line of cases in the sentencing context, he had gotten pretty worked up about those cases by the end of his tenure and was not yes. on the team anymore. And uh, Justice Kavanaugh, if he becomes Justice Kavanaugh, could right. uh, be a solid vote for defendants in those cases if he follows those originalist leanings. And I don't, I don't think we know for certain whether he's going to. Yeah, we don't. But it, but it is possible that, for example, Crawford, which is about the, you know, it's a very important line of uh, cases about, you know, the right to be confronted with the witnesses against you. Kennedy's replacement and subsequent uh, Kennedy's retirement, subsequent replacement with Kavanaugh may have actually saved those cases. Because it wasn't clear to me actually that like if you'd held a vote at the end of last term on whether Crawford should be overruled, I'm not sure I know which way that would come out. Uh, because he, he was never much of a fan of it and you're sort of counting on the chief at that point or maybe Breyer or somebody. So, uh, so that's really interesting. But he also has some, there, uh, in, in addition to the things we're just sort of enjoyably guessing about his views, he has uh, some things that he's expressed views about on the DC circuit like repeatedly over the years that have become themes and I would expect them to remain themes um, in his jurisprudence. So the first one is you referred to him, we were having breakfast talking about this, uh, you referred to him with a, a very good phrase which is he's a mens rea hawk, right? What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, I, I was surprised by this. And one thing that's interesting is just that he has written uh, on a number of criminal issues, which is which is kind of surprising given that it's the D.C. Circuit. They just don't have nearly as many criminal cases as the other courts of appeals, but they do get a few, um, but they all are coming out of D.C., whereas the other circuits can draw on a bunch of different states. Uh, but he has written separately in several cases involving mens rea issues, always to urge sort of a more aggressive pro-defendant position, saying we, need, we really need to be strict about requiring mens rea, requiring proof of knowledge, um, you know, depending on the specifics of the case. And uh, that's an interesting position. It, it's one that I don't think necessarily has anything to do with originalism. Right. Um, because it's not, it's not about uh, interpreting the Constitution. It's about how to interpret federal criminal statutes. Right. There are some arguments for you know, why mens rea is an important doctrine going back hundreds of years. Um, but it's, it seems not necessarily drawn by those meth you know yeah. driven by those methodological commitments right and it's it it, it doesn't clearly uh, it, it there's like one big Supreme Court case you know basically about it or maybe two right there's this case staples uh, which uh, my former uh, first year students uh, at Harvard used to have to uh, you know learn all about because it was the basis for their one writing assignments um, but there's not like there's like some you know enduring the, the Supreme Court just doesn't have many cases and so what would be interesting is and we've talked about this many times is the replacement of a justice doesn't just change how the existing cases come out it changes what cases they take right maybe just because he's interested 
right? And so if he gets interested in these mens rea cases and starts kind of bring, you know, listing them at conference, listing them for discussion, saying we need to be taking these things, that could change the mix and like change mens rea law in the whole country just because no one was really paying attention before and now they are. Uh, and that could be, you know, that could be quite significant because like yeah. the, the example that we were talking about is this case Burwell where it's, you know, it's illegal to carry a gun in furtherance of like you know, certain crimes. And if it's a semi-automatic gun, it's a 10-year mandatory minimum. If it's an automatic weapon, it's a 30-year mandatory minimum. And the government's position in that case, and they were successful, was you don't have to know it's an automatic weapon. Um, and Kavanaugh's like, no, 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 you, you should have to know because that, you know, we have this presumption that mens rea attaches to every element of the offense, and this is clearly one of the elements. Um, so, like, you know, th this can be a big deal, like a lot of years in like a number of cases. Yeah, and I think one thing that's interesting about these mens rea issues is that it is uh, a criminal law issue, I think, that is more likely to be a benefit to you know, sort of white collar defendants than sort of ordinary street criminals. Um, and, you know, cynics might say, well, that's why, you know, conservatives favor men mens rea reform, but they don't favor these other kinds of criminal law reforms. Um, so I, I think it's it's definitely important. Uh, yeah, and, and ex explain why you think that, because I also have a sense that that's true, but I was having trouble exactly articulating well, I mean, why I, I thought I think so. There's, it has come up uh, the in first a, part a lot of cases involving. Um, you know, criminal violations for uh, failing to follow like administrative regulations, things mm -hmm. like that. And that's one very significant context where people want to be able to say, no, you have to make to prove that I, I knew I wasn't violating the uh, I was violating the administrative regulation or something like that. Right. Or you know, like yeah. I imagine this comes up, I bet, in like securities fraud cases, yeah. right, which may have you know sort of quite technical requirements. And if the mens rea requirements mm -hmm. are really strong on each element, then you know you could be like yeah. you know because we had a, there was a sort of Two years ago, I think the very first episode of the show, uh, we talked about a sort of securities law case that had that you know aspect of it, where you know did you have to know about the, for example, the, that the other person was receiving a benefit or not? Yeah. If you really you know jacked that up, that could be significant. Yeah. All right, that's, that's Whereas in, in sort of like a, a drug case, you know, there are some borderline cases where someone says I didn't know it was drugs or things like that. But but for the most part, the thing that's that's really harsh about the law is not the mens rea requirement; it's just the sentence that attaches to the drug possession. Right. Um, so that stuff's pretty interesting. He also has something that I know uh, is of uh, great interest to this crowd, which is he has very strong and repeatedly articulated views on the use of acquitted conduct, so-called acquitted conduct, at sentencing. Um, and so for those of you who don't know what this is, imagine um, you've got, this, this is a real case uh, in this, uh, involving a defendant named Duvall. He's charged both with uh, some minor distribution of drugs uh, and also uh, involvement in a quite wide-ranging drug conspiracy. And the evidence on the former was pretty good, but they went to trial because the defense lawyer thought, you know, he, he really wasn't involved in this big drug conspiracy. So the jury convicts him of the first thing um, and they acquit him of the second thing. And then at sentencing, the judge says, well, in, taking, in, in calculating your guideline sentence, I'm going to take into account the fact that I believe by a preponderance of the evidence you were involved in that drug conspiracy, uh, even though the jury acquitted you and he sentences him to like 20 years. And he's probably looking at more like four or five uh, if it had just been the first thing. So Kavanaugh is completely against this, and he has expressed this several times. He says that there are serious due process problems with this. Uh, he, there's a Supreme Court case that pretty clearly seems to authorize uh, using that kind of acquitted conduct. So he's always sort of been writing separately and saying the doctrine should be revisited. Uh, but now he's going to be in a spot where he can do some revisiting. Yeah, and the thing that I'm struggling with here is I don't know how to draw a principled line that forbids courts from doing that, but doesn't then outlaw all discretionary sentencing. You and I were talking about this a little bit yeah. earlier, and the problem is, you know, historically, discretionary sentencing within a statutory range has always been considered fine, and judges can consider whatever they want in that range. Uh, and then if you start saying, well, you can't consider uh, a crime that of which the defendant was acquitted, okay, well, what about, you know, what, what can you consider? Does that just inevitably lead to only mandatory sentencing, which I don't think that anyone in the court is going to find palatable? Right, yeah, because you could have a rule, and this is the kind of what I was bouncing off of you, you could have a rule that said, well, just like every fact that increases the maximum sentence has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, that's, a, that's the whole Apprendi line of cases in the first place. And now, just like every fact that increases the mandatory minimum, uh, has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a lane from like six years ago or five years ago. You could just say any fact that goes up within the range would be, have to be proven by a reasonable doubt. But as you say, that means that the there's jury, no there's no anymore. discretionary sentencing yeah. anymore. And although that rule is workable, it is quite ahistorical. And it'd be, it would be hard to imagine, you know, a bunch of rip-roaring originalists uh, getting so excited about this that they would over, I mean, that would revolutionize sentencing practice in the United States. Every, everything would be different because it would also be binding on the states. Right, so it's hard to figure out, like, okay, if you can't do that, 
then where do, where's the middle stopping point in between here and there? Maybe the answer is, well, that's why the Supreme Court hasn't overruled this doctrine is yeah. because it's actually pretty hard to think of. So you know, I don't know if you have a, an, an instinct about whether he's going to get I mean, because he's committed on this at this point. You know, I, th I think he might well succeed in getting the issue before the court. I'm not sure he's going to craft a majority for, with five votes. I think it's very hard to write that opinion. Yeah, uh, and I suppose you could, I mean, one alternative, one alternative we were also sort of talking about is you could say, well, any fact that the jury would have necessarily had to acquit you of, uh, to acquit you on that charge, those are the facts you can't take into account. But it's like, we do that sometimes in the, in the double jeopardy context or a similar kind of uh, exercise, and it's quite conceptually challenging. And you're going to turn every sentencing into that. There's no way the judges are going to get that right most of the time. And you're going to have a huge number of appeals that turn on this. It's going to be like the categorical approach, where it's just like this like big area of law all of a sudden it's using up this disproportionate amount of time. Um, I don't know, but he does feel very strong about it. And I can't imagine, by the way, that he hasn't thought of this problem. I mean, it took you and you know you and I got there in about two seconds. He's a smart guy, uh, and I'm sure that his law clerks have you know sort of discussed this with him, and he's discussed it with his colleagues. I just don't know what his answers are because, as far as I can tell, they do not appear in the opinions I have read. Um, and so, I don't know. But it would be exciting if that happened. Yeah. So here's an interesting question. In you know, let's assume Judge Kavanaugh gets confirmed, uh, and then we have a court that has Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch on it. How does that court to you look different, and does it look different uh, in terms of sort of questions of federal criminal law versus what the court was like two or three years ago? It looks, it looks pretty different. I mean, for one thing, as between those two people and, like, for example, Justice Kennedy, I mean, there's a lot of issues where as a criminal, as a lawyer at the court, I would rather have had Kennedy, right? So if I'm, if I'm the, like, petitioner in Obergefell asking for nationwide same-sex marriage, I want Justice Kennedy, not Justice Kavanaugh. But if I'm a criminal defendant in what I would call primary criminal cases, like not habeas, yeah. right, not the Eighth Amendment, uh, for example, but in like the kind of stuff we're talking about, those aren't guaranteed votes for me by a long shot. But actually, Kennedy was hard to get on that stuff. Yeah. He, he was kind of a hawk. Although on the substance of federal criminal law, so he and Justice Scalia were both, both took the position in skilling, right, one of the biggest um, white collar criminal cases in recent years that the law was unconstitutionally vague. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and, and it, yeah, you, we don't want to reduce that. You know, none of those are these people are, are stereotypes, right? Yeah. But it looks so. It looks different in in that sense. It also looks different in I think a more substantive sense, which is you've now got on the court three self-proclaimed originalists. Um, and Justice Gorsuch last term uh, wrote an opinion where he basically said, if you're not putting these originalist opinions for the defendant in the briefs don't expect me to insert them for you. Like these are, I, I'm going to regard those as forfeited if you don't kind of like develop them enough. And that was in Carpenter, the cell, the cell phone case that we'll talk about in a little bit. And so now you've got him, you've got Kavanaugh, and you've got Thomas for as long as he's there, which could be quite a long time as far as anyone is aware. I think it's going to change the way that those cases get briefed and litigated, right? Because now it's not just oh, you got kind of these two originalist weirdos off to the side, uh, kind of one of whom doesn't ask questions at oral argument. And now you've got two people at oral argument who are like young, presumably active questioners. Kavanaugh was always an active questioner when I saw him and certainly when I appeared before him. And they're going to be asking, a, you know, originalist questions. That's just going to change the field of the argument, I think, quite a bit. Yeah, well, and also in terms of statutory interpretation, Justice Gorsuch, I thought one of his more surprising uh, votes um, early in his tenure was in Marinello, right, which is a case about... Um, lying to the IRS, where he, he didn't take the strict textualist position uh, advanced by Justices Alito and Thomas and actually sided with the majority and was willing to be a little bit looser with interpretation of statutory language in order to avoid roping in innocent conduct. So mm -hmm. you know, he might be receptive to defendant-friendly arguments in those contexts. Yeah, I think so. So um, uh, yeah, we, were gonna, we wanted to talk a little bit about you know, Justice Gorsuch. I mean, he is still the new guy. I think that with him, we, I, I, have, I think I have more reason to believe that he is quite willing to pull the trigger for criminal defendants, uh, both in statutory cases like the one you described and in those constitutional con law cases like Carpenter, which we'll talk about in a little bit. He's going to do it his own way, right? Um, but he is, he, in other words, has no hesitation. And that's because you, you think he's methodologically different from the way you're expecting Judge Kavanaugh to behave if he comes to justice? I, I think, yeah, I think so. Because I think that he is, there is something about his personality that I think leaves him quite comfortable kind of being out there on his own mm -hmm. in a way that I think I'm not, I don't get the same sense from Kavanaugh. And so he's willing to be like. He doesn't, he doesn't care about being liked. He, uh, he does not care yeah. about being liked that much. Um, it's because he's a brave Colorado like me. Yeah. Um, so I'm I just think gonna, that there's. Can I just put in a quick plug for, we had um, the author of a new book called The Most Dangerous Branch by, by a guy named David Kaplan, which is sort of one of these tell-all books about the Supreme Court. We had him on the show last week. Yeah. Um, 
it's a really interesting if you find court gossip interesting. He got a lot of people to talk to him sort of on background, and so he tells a lot of stories, one of which is how right after he showed up at the court, Justice Gorsuch said, you know, I don't really want to come to the first conference. I've got, you know, I've got plans to take my daughter on a college visit, and this made the Chief Justice and some of the other justices very mad at him. Yes. He, he also showed up to his official court picture you know, the, where they take the, the big, the nine of them all together for that. You know, you've seen the, this, ver this version of this picture hanging in places, I'm sure. Uh, so he showed up to take that picture, uh, and he thought it would be funny to show up wearing uh, his uh, Denver Broncos jersey um, because he's a big Broncos guy like me as well. Uh, and the, the chief did not find that as funny as Justice Gorsuch did. Um, but he's just a guy, he, he's just a guy who just doesn't care that much, right? Um, so I think Kavanaugh will be a little bit different in that respect. I'm curious, I mean, and this, you know, this is a bit, you know, adjacent at least to what we've been talking about. I'm curious to see if Kavanaugh joins the cert pool because if he doesn't, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of done. And let's explain what that is for the yeah. people that I'm sure some people are familiar with that. But basically, uh, for the last 40 years or so, a significant number of Supreme Court justices have pooled their clerks uh, on the court to review certiorari positions rather than have each of their clerks sort of look at all of them. And you know, the number of justices who are in the pool versus doing it all internally has fluctuated. Right now it is at seven because Justices Alito and Gorsuch don't participate. And Justice Gorsuch just said, you know what, I'm not going to join when he showed up. And even though, you know, I think that there was a lot of institutional pressure coming from the Chief Justice to join because uh, it makes, makes, their, <laughs> makes the other justices' lives easier if more justices join the pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the question is then if you've got, you know, Kavanaugh's going to have to decide what he does. I bet he probably joins. But if he doesn't, then you've got the three kind of newest uh, conservative appointees, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, all of them are out of the pool. I think at that point, the pressure for one of the more liberal justices, you know, Sotomayor or Kagan would be logical ones. They're already both insanely hard workers, so, you know, what's another few hours a day uh, to go out too because they don't want to be the only, you know, you, know, you don't want to have an asymmetry there where they're off, you know, roaming the land looking for interesting ways uh, to you know, destroy public sector unions or whatever, and you're not doing the the sort of converse uh, on your side. So uh, it could be the end of this like institution that has been you know kind of a staple of the court's life for a long time. So uh, that'll be interesting, and we'll have to see what happens. So um, any other thoughts on on Kavanaugh? You catch any any of the hearings? Find them fun? Uh, a little bit. They were they were pretty wild. Yeah, they were fun. I like the weird thing where like on the on day two, Kamala Harris was demonstrating what I thought were actually substantial like skills as a, a former prosecutor in cross-examination when she was like, have you ever had a conversation with anybody at this law firm about the Mueller investigation? And like the, you could really see like this person used to be a real lawyer, like in a real courtroom, because there's like a disciplined manner here that like usually isn't present in Senate questioning. And everyone was like, ooh, she's got some bombshell where, where, where he's been like chatting about the Mueller investigation with Trump's lawyer. He's done for. And then the next day she came back to it and he was like, no, I never did. She was like, well, I wish you'd said that yesterday. And I was like, what was this yeah. then? What was this whole line yeah. of questioning? What, were you just taking a shot in the dark? Um, so I don't know what that was supposed to be, but it didn't really turn into anything too bad. And then Senator Booker, you know, released some of the emails that had been designated committee confidential and threatened them to, you know, punish him for violating the rules, although it's unclear whether he actually did violate the rules or not. It seems like he probably didn't. Yeah. But then most of those emails that have come out, there, there was nothing particularly... Yeah, the, well, not yeah. that Kavanaugh wrote, yeah. right? Like he seems yeah. to have been copied was, on. He, yeah. Some of his friends don't seem like great people, I'll put yeah. it that way. Um, but yeah. he's, you know, they, he didn't they seem, seem to have, have a pretty wild sailing trip. Uh, yeah. yeah. You notice that the sailing, so the, there were some emails exchanged about a, a wild sailing trip that I, was, I think it was like September 7th through 9th, 2001. Ooh, okay. Really yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, more innocent times. Um, so uh, pretty interesting, but we should move on uh, as we have promised and, sh and shall deliver some thoughts on um, OT 2017, the term that has just ended uh, a couple of months ago before we talk about things we want to talk about next term. Um, so before we get into any specific cases, what are your sort of overarching thoughts as you look back on the, the year that we had? I mean, we, you know, we, we talked about the court basically every single week. Uh, we read a huge uh, portion of their output. What, what is your mood uh, or your sort of like overall gestalt of the court's year last year? Well, it's going to be hard for me personally to you know, ignore the fact that it was the final term for Justice Kennedy for whom I clerked. I mean, that's just going to make it a very, very bittersweet year for me. So it, it's hard for me to really disentangle that. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I think we often experience, we often think this term is going to be incredibly huge. And it is rare that the terms over deliver. And usually they become a little bit, there's a little bit of fizzling mm -hmm. where some of the cases that seem like they're going to be really, really big uh, turn out to be 
not quite as big. And there yeah. was there was some of that. There was um, definitely a fair amount of that, yeah. right? Like so, you know, the partisan gerrymandering cases yeah. we'll talk about. I sort of joked around on Twitter that it was like the justices were like a kid who got up the top of a ski slope and then got scared and had to scoot down in their butts uh, because they just you know realized these issues were basically too hard. Um, I, I feel that way too. I, I feel like it, the the year now the year only makes sense. Now that I understand, this was this was Kennedy's last year, and I, and I have a I don't know if this is true, but like my kind of gut tells me, he didn't make that decision midway through June, right? He's probably thinking for a while, you know, this might be it. Especially if what so one of the things that Kaplan reports in his book is that uh, Kennedy's children had, be, had started to become quite worried about his health, um, that he's you know he's not in imminent danger of dying tomorrow or anything, but his you know his memory was perhaps declining as, as it does happen when you get older, um, and so if that's what was going on, this was this. The term makes more sense to me as the final term of a man who had not firmly decided maybe toward the end, but was thinking, this this might be it for me. Um, and that during the year, I, I kind of didn't, yeah. it didn't make sense until the end that that was true. Yeah. So, yeah. And then there were some interesting features, like he didn't side with the liberals in any five fours for yeah. the first time in, I think, more than a decade Yeah, that happened, which, yeah. is, which is unusual. Yeah, it's very unusual, yeah. right? Yeah. And like all these, all these big cases where we thought, you know, oh, he wants to, you know, one last time, he wants to finally resolve the partisan gerrymandering thing, or he wants to go out in a blaze of glory in, you know, the travel ban case. And it's like, no, you know, you, at some level you have misunderstood all along who this man really is. Um, he thinks of himself, he really does, as a conservative Republican, um, you know, a child of the Reagan Revolution. Yes, he has his heterodoxies, but that's, you know, he was, he was, he never thought of himself as like, you know, if you're on the left, as like on your team, okay? He just never did. And that last term is like, this is, you know, this is how he thought of himself. Um, and so, yeah, so there's that. I think that's true. So um, you want to talk a little about the, uh, the cases? Yeah, I think we probably should. I mean, I think that the, you know, in terms of the biggest case of the term, I think it probably is the travel ban case, Trump versus Hawaii. Right? I think that's this right. is a case that we had been, you know, waiting since, you know, the final day of the previous term uh, where they issued uh, an opinion uh, granting the case and granting a partial stay. Um, and, you know, we really didn't know how this one was going to come out. This was a challenge to the president's, you know, twice revised uh, entry ban. And you know, Ian, um, I'm not too proud to to sort of poke you. I knew you were going to say uh, this. You know, you, you predicted that it was going to be a victor, a victory for the challengers, a uh, victory I did. for Neil Kachal. I did. You know, he, he had a very impressive argument in the case. I did. Uh, but I ultimately, it's a five-four victory for the administration. Um, a pretty sweeping opinion by the Chief Justice, you know, sort of quickly resolves some statutory questions and then spends a lot of time on the constitutional question and just says this is, you know, within the President's power and as long as there's some rational justification for doing this, we are not going to inquire further into the fact that the President made these various statements uh, on the campaign trail and after yeah. that might indicate racial animus, uh, provokes, you know, a sort of tepid Breyer dissent and, and then a very fiery Sotomayor dissent. Uh, where she, you know, draws on uh, Korematsu, the Japanese internment case, uh, which then provokes the Chief Justice into saying, well, you know, this isn't like that at all, and we're, that case has been overruled in the Court of History, uh, which is an institution uh, whose rules I don't fully understand. Um, <laughs> yeah, Dan nominated himself as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of History, uh, so congratulations. And also I would like to say, uh, I, I, you know, since I think, I think that we're among the company where this will make uh, sense to describe it this way, I like to think of my prediction uh, a victory for the challengers of having been acquitted on four counts, uh, which is, a, I understand, a partial success. Um, so you know you can't you can't get them all. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because it that uh, there's this Kennedy opinion in the case, which is a concurrence that is mm -hmm. quite difficult actually to parse. And yeah. you know after I read Kaplan's book and sort of the, the concerns about his health, I was like, I, I wonder if like the reason it's hard to parse is because like it. it he hadn't totally gotten it clear in his own mind, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't know, because it's a very strange document that it's actually even a little bit hard to describe. I mean, you should probably try to... Yeah, I mean, he sort of suggests that there's some possibility that the proceedings are going to continue on remand, which is very hard to square with the way the opinion is written. It's in a preliminary injunction posture, so that's theoretically possible, but the opinion seems to resolve all the legal questions. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if he was confused about that or, or what. It, I, I found that a little puzzling. And then he sort of says, you know... Something like you know the nation, the world is watching, and to see that our democracy is working. Um, yeah, and I was like, but then yeah, yeah dude, course, I know. <laughs> you know, he signs on and it doesn't want to do anything to stop this policy. Yeah. And another thing that that was in the, that Kaplan book, um, which was interesting, suggested that Justice Kennedy isn't a fan of the president, and specifically, you know, gave a speech about 
the importance of immigration uh, at a very small party, not a public speech, but a small party he was at mm -hmm. uh, in L.A. Uh, around the time one of the travel bans was, was being issued. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, I do too, because he, he, you know, one thing that's very true of him is he's a very kind of cosmopolitan man. Like, he, you know, he really likes overseas travel. Um, you know, he really, you know, he thinks of himself as, you know, he, he, a true citizen of the world, right? And I think that that, um, that element of his nature is, is sort of very strong. Um, and so the, the interesting thing, though, about the travel ban, in some ways it's the biggest case of the last term. In some ways it's like kind of the smallest because going forward, what is the law uh, that has been affected by this area? Like, well, it's just this one executive order, which is important. I mean, it's a very important executive order, and the principle certainly matters a great deal. But it's not like there's a, you know, what, what's the citation count going to look like for Trump versus Hawaii in future cases? How often is this really going to be, um, you, you know, an important source of legal principles? And you might say, well, but in the cases where it is an important source of legal principles, those are going to be the most important ones. Yeah, maybe. Um, but I also think that the cases where it would even be a conceivably relevant source of legal authority are also the ones that are least dictated by precedent. Right, so it's like if you have a d different looking court 25 years down the line and there's a similar sort of case, I can tell you it is not gonna come out because of anything the chief said in Trump versus Hawaii. It's gonna come out because of what those you know, five members of that majority think is the right answer. So um, the other case that we thought was gonna be really big, in fact, I repeatedly referred to it as the biggest case of your life, uh, is the gerrymandering cases. So uh, why don't you tell everybody what an exciting life you've had? Yeah, I mean, so the court, uh, in my life continues, luckily. Um, uh, the court, you know, so granted, sorry, granted is the wrong word because these were cases coming up with part, as part of the court's mandatory appellate jurisdiction from three judges district courts, but the court agreed to hear argument uh, in the first case, Gill, and then heard argument, and then, you know, at that argument, a lot of people thought Justice Kennedy was leading towards uh, ruling for the challengers, uh, you know, in striking down this partisan gerrymander. And that was quite significant. Uh, Justice Kennedy had, you know, more than a decade earlier written a concurring opinion where he, he didn't do that in a case called uh, Beef v. Jubilee, where he had sort of indicated, you know, basically, you know, waffled, you know, in the pages of the U.S. reports, where he's like, this is really hard. Here's one concern. Here's the other concern. I don't know what to do. Uh, and so people thought, okay, he's now finally made up his mind and is going to do it. Then they agreed to hear argument. Uh, in a second case, um, where there was no particular reason why they needed to, that case had refused to grant an injunction right. uh, against a gerrymander. And so they agreed to hear argument. This is several months into the term. They heard argument. At that argument, it didn't really seem any clearer what was going on. Yeah, and we were all so yeah. excited, right? Remember when we were leading up, we were previewing that case. We're like, well, we're going to get a lot of insight into what they were thinking about the first one because, you know, what do they want to know about this case that's different? And it, and it was like this, it was like the exact same argument as the first time. It's like nothing had happened in the interim. It's like they forgot to do any work on the first case and so they granted the second one. It was completely bizarre. So then what happens? So then the whole thing uh, fizzles out. I mean, you have this opinion in, in Gill by the Chief Justice who says, look, you know, we're not going to resolve the underlying constitutional question here, but there's a standing problem here because of the plaintiffs and you're challenging this uh, statewide map, but really you need people who are challenging their specific districts. Yeah. Uh, and then you also like, have okay. a four justice concurrence for Justice Kagan and the other liberal justices sort of mapping out how on remand uh, the plaintiffs could go ahead and craft a case that could conceivably get to the same remedy in this case. Yeah. And then my favorite is the way they resolved the other one, which yeah, is called Benisek. Benisek yeah. um, is they said, well, here's the thing. This is an appeal from a denial of a preliminary injunction. And um, one of the reasons the district court didn't, didn't issue the preliminary injunction is because we had just granted this case Gill, and so they wanted to see what we were going to say uh, in, in this case Gill. And that's a totally normal and good reason not to grant a preliminary injunction, so the district court didn't abuse its discretion, affirmed. It's like, what is that? Like, okay, the, 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 this has a snake eating its own uh, tail quality about it, um, and, which I really don't appreciate. Um, but it, just, it was pretty obvious that they were just like, get us out of these cases by any means possible. You know what I mean? Like, if can we just bribe Benisek to like move to a new state so that he loses standing too? I mean, like, I think they would have done anything because they just couldn't get to an answer. Um, I mean, Justice Breyer at the second argument was like openly suggesting, well, why don't we grant this North Carolina case and we'll re-argue them all next term and we'll get all the alternatives up there on like a big blackboard and like argue about what to do. And, and it's and sort of strategically hard for them to know what to do because because I think the other justices didn't know whether Justice Kennedy was leaving, and right. so I think. Justice Kagan is writing this concurrence in the hopes that he stays on for another term and that it gets back up there and then they can mm -hmm. uh, affirm. Uh, but obviously that's not going to happen. And I think, you know, we don't know for certain, but I, I think uh, 
it's quite likely, almost certain, uh, that you know, soon to be Justice Kavanaugh uh, will not want to recognize a constitutional right here. Oh, yeah, I would, be, I would be very surprised, yeah. right? That, because that would the, shock me. The orthodox sort of like legal conservative kind of smart position in these cases has long been what they said in Veith, where there were just four justices, uh, I think it was a Scalia opinion, where he said, you, you know, these cases aren't justiciable, right? Like there, there's li it's not that partisan gerrymandering is necessarily legal. It's that th there is no judicially administrable remedy for it. And so you just got to do something else about this. This is just, you know, the nature of the beast. Um, and so I've, that feels to me like, you know, if, if I were a betting man, I'd bet on that outcome on this one. So um, we, we thought that was going to be a big deal, and it would have cr created an entire body of partisan gerrymandering law. Right now, this summer, we would have been witnessing three-judge district courts all over the country rapidly attempting to do something with these maps in advance of the midterm elections, uh, and then none of that ended up happening. So um, the case I was most interested in this term uh, is actually an important criminal procedure case, a very important criminal procedure case uh, called Carpenter versus United States, uh, which is on its face about whether or not the government needs a warrant to track your movements using your cell phone. Uh, and the reason I was so interested in this is that's actually the topic of my student note from uh, at this point more than 10 years ago when I was just graduating law school. Uh, and there was like a nascent uh, split among the magistrate judges in like the Eastern District of New York and like I think Texas. Um, and I was like, well, this will be a little interesting thing. You know, it's a fine student note. Uh, didn't get cited in the opinion. Thanks a lot. Um, but um, it's also a really important criminal procedure opinion. I mean, so the, what the court ends up saying is that yes, you do need a warrant. Uh, to get people historical records of people's information uh, because it is a search under the Fourth Amendment and there is no you know, applicable uh, exception to the warrant requirement. But to get there, they had to confront you know, what is probably the least loved doctrine in all of constitutional criminal procedure, at least by academics, which is the so-called third party doctrine. Because what the government had been saying is, look, these are just business records held by a cell phone provider, right? So it's like the cell phone provider has this information about when you sort of you know, used various towers, and yes, we can use that to get your information, but this isn't in substance that different from a subpoena, right? We're saying turn over the records that you have, um, and the Stored Communications Act allows us to do that. And th that's a pretty good argument, uh, I have to say, because they're right. It is a lot like a subpoena, and this really does illustrate the be careful what you wish for principle, because the Chief Justice, in his opinion, then says, well, I don't recall us ever saying anything about subpoenas not being subject to the Fourth Amendment, to, w to which the reaction, I'm sure, of every prosecutor was, excuse me, what, what did you just say? Uh, that's true, you've never said that, but literally the premise of our profession is that they don't. Uh, it's quite important, actually, that they he don't. He said that if, if we've never said you can't, uh, you don't have a re you can subpoena something that which there you have a, in which you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. That's how yeah. it sort of gets around it. Yeah, exactly, right? And and so and so everyone's losing their mind saying that's because we never thought you could have such a, a reasonable expectation of privacy in a document that a third party held. That, that it's like that is like so foundational to the way criminal investigations work, especially in big white collar cases where you're looking at like a lot of records and investigations and your subpoena and te you know, testimony things like that. And so the chief doesn't you know he doesn't really go too much further with that because it's not necessary for this particular case, uh, but he does say that like the question is, you know, the third party doctrine is whether to extend it to this new area, which itself is kind of a revolutionary yeah. move because I had never understood this to be a kind of area by yeah. area approach. It's a categorical statement about when you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Yeah, not anymore, baby. Yeah. <laughs> not after this. Yeah. Um, and so the, I think that, you know, the, the effect of Carpenter in terms of location privacy, I think, is important. Um, I don't think it's actually that hard to get a warrant. So, I, you know, it's not like the government won't be able to observe people's movements if they have probable cause, which is, you know, not the highest standard in the world, as we all know. But uh, its effects, if those statements are taken seriously by lower courts, uh, its effects in terms of, you, you know, subpoena practice in the United States, its effects in terms of way investigations work, could be enormous, right? Now, it might be the case that once courts get up to the line and they realize what that would mean um, and they really start to grapple with like you know you can't seriously mean you need to have probable cause for this huge range of things I mean, this is how we get probable cause right how are we supposed to start the investigations it might be the courts get up to the line and then they think nah never mind uh, we you know d don't take that too seriously that's possible right um, but it was a very interesting case you know the chief justice writes this opinion for himself and the former liberal justices so he crossed over this term uh, and in a couple which, which he's only done a couple other times in his whole tenure yeah in, the, he, in five fours yeah and he did it twice this year yeah. at least right yeah. the, the other one being a kind of ricky and, and he now we expect him to be the median justice and you know the swing justice uh, yeah you know to the, yeah to the extent that which is interesting because we, we we've talked with people and i think we talked with um uh, was it with Lee about this, where 
it's, it's actually maybe never been the case that the median justice on the court is also the chief justice, uh, which is an incredibly, I mean, both of those positions, like one of the, the chief justice has a bunch of formal powers and the median justice has a bunch of practical powers. For all of those to be vested in a single person is really something um, because what that means is he has a practical matter in every single big important case. He decides how it comes out. He can write it himself. He can decide, you know, like a, a lot, everything. Who writes, if he signs it to someone else, do I want someone who's going to write a broad opinion or write a narrow opinion? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's also, you know, a very, very capable writer himself. So, I mean, there's, there's, he has a lot of things going for him. He's, you know, has a chance of being, you know, one of the two or three most influential justices of the Supreme Court ever. Yeah. You know, if he stays chief justice for long enough and the court doesn't shift too much around him in the meantime. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and the thing is, I, it's long been clear that he would like to have more unanimous opinions coming out of the court. That was like his big aspiration when he went onto the court. The problem is, he doesn't have any. Uh, he didn't have any practical way to force that to happen, right? Because he's not the deciding vote in a lot of cases, and there's really not an, anything you can kind of do about it. But now there is, right? Now if he says, "Listen, we're gonna, there's going to be some changes around here. I want I want us to be all on the same team a lot more often. And if you don't do it, you are not going to like what happens, right? That's the implicit I mean, background. Yeah, threat. you wouldn't say that. Explicitly. You wouldn't say that. That's but not like, the way it works. It's, well, it's not the way it works. But like, you know, I think it was pretty clear, for example, that people were very careful to tend to Justice Kennedy's like feelings on the court because people are human, right? This guy's an important vote. He's an important colleague of yours. Let's, you know, let's, if, if there are ways we can kind of make him happy, look, you can't browbeat people, but if there are ways we can keep this guy happy, then let's do it. And it's like, okay, now you keep me happy. And you know what's gonna make me happy? Nine to zero, okay? So uh, I don't want any more of these like stupid seven to two dissents and like random little cases. Like stop doing that. Uh, I don't know if he has any interest in that, but you know, he could. Do you know who isn't gonna care what he thinks? Justice Gorsuch. No, yeah, that's the problem is he has to, and that must just kill him. You know what I mean? It must just kill him to have this irritating Coloradan around. Now I know how you feel. Uh, so Carpenter's big. Um, what do you want to talk about next? Should you just quickly touch on Janus? That's maybe one of the most important decisions of the term. Yeah, let's just briefly mention Janus because it's not a criminal law case, but it is, you know, it's a really big deal. Um, and I think it does illustrate something about the court of the future uh, in an important way that even goes beyond its area. So Janus is this case that we've basically been waiting for for a long time. It was a case that uh, decided whether or not public sector unions can collect so-called agency fees uh, from all of the employees that they represent, not just members. Um, and so agency fees are not supposed to be used on political activities like you know, campaigns and stuff. They're used to support the costs uh, of collective bargaining and all the stuff that by statute you have to do for the whole bargaining unit, uh, even people who aren't members of the union. Um, and so there had been challenges to the, this basic arrangement, which stretches back to the 1970s, kind of brewing for a while. Um, and it actually kind of got kicked off in a case about six years ago uh, that was sort of about this basic arrangement, but about some minor version of it, when Justice Kennedy asked, well, isn't everything a public sector union does inherently political at oral argument? And which kind of just stopped the lawyer dead in their tracks because it wasn't really what that case was about at all. And they were like, you know, basically the answer is, well, if you took that seriously, you couldn't collect agency fees for anything, right? It's like, well, six years later, uh, that is the right answer. Uh, I am, I'm sorry to tell you if you are a, a sort of labor side lawyer, that's exactly the right answer. And what the court did is they sort of wrote a series of opinions all by Justice Alito saying, at first, like, you know, this doctrine, this old precedent, uh, Abood is the name of the case, you know, there are inter some interesting things to kind of question about it. Uh, it's not super clear it was rightly decided. And then in the next one, it was like, in fact, Abood was, was probably wrongly decided, uh, in fact, but we don't have to overrule it. Uh, but we, we'll just limit its uh, scope uh, in this particular case about home health workers. Uh, and then you get up to, uh, first, it, first it was a case called Friedrich, but then Justice Scalia died and the court deadlocked 4-4. And you get to Janus, and now what the opinion says is, well, yeah, sure, Abood uh, has been out there for a while, but its, you know, its foundations have been seriously undermined. By uh, me. Yeah. By me, yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been let it, you know, it's really, it's really come under substantial questioning, CEG, like all the opinions I've been writing. Um, and so now, uh, you know, its stare decisis effect is weakened and it's overruled. So it's a really big wait, wait, deal. Wait, I think we're going to see that move. That, that, in that move cases. is coming back. That's yeah. exactly what I thought, too. That, like, that yeah. is, in other words, maybe you, in abortion cases. Maybe in abortion cases, yeah. right? Like, that would be a potential way to do it. Maybe in, like, you know, in other words, Justice Alito has sort of demonstrated this kind of playbook for how to take an old doctrine that has like kind of long been a thorn in your side and like, you know, kind of slowly put it to sleep. 
right, in a way that doesn't feel like avulsive, in a way that's going to bother like the chief, for example, who you're going to need to have help you do this stuff, but that also gets the job done. Um, and so you might see that in all sorts of areas, like the, you know, the religion clause cases, I think would be a prime example for this. I know that in his heart of hearts, Employment Division versus Smith is one of Alito's least favorite cases. You better believe the foundations of that one uh, are going to get undermined uh, and then eventually overruled, things like that. That's going to happen, I think, over and over um, because there's a lot of stuff out there. That, you know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of business to be done, and I think that this is the basic recipe to do it, is you sort of do it you know, not, not in one day, but, you know, we'll be here for a while. We'll be here for five or six years. These are life tenures, you know? So uh, pretty interesting case. And, you know, and, and all, this to, you know, all this to say, by the way, a lot of people regard, I mean, I, I said on, uh, I think I said on Twitter, or maybe on the show, that, like, I really hope to have a day as good in my life as the Janus decision day was for, like, Justice Alito and other people who have long opposed uh, Abood on, you know, very, you know, grounds of principle, right? That's a good day. It's an enormous victory. Like, it's the kind of thing that sitting back there in the 1980s, they would have been like, well, we'll never be able to do something like that. Like, it's just too well entrenched. Um, and so, it, you know, it's an enormous victory. I mean, I, you know, I would have come out the other way, but like, you know, still, it, it's worth appreciating how significant that was um, to a lot of people. So, so that's Janice, the shape of things to come. And so uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just very quickly talk about Masterpiece Cake Shop, which was maybe the most anticipated case uh, of the term, or one of the two or three most anticipated cases of the term, but one that really turned into a dud. I mean, the question is, whether states, through their public accommodations laws, can require uh, a baker to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Um, we don't get an answer to that question. Instead, uh, what we're told is that uh, if you're going to, uh, as a state, say someone violated your public accommodations laws, um, don't say really, really mean things about religion uh, during the state administrative hearings. Yeah. Uh, that's what, what the dude said was, this is the weirdest thing. So it's like a 15-member commission or something. And one of the commissioners said, Freedom of religion uh, has been used to justify all kinds of discrimination throughout history, whether it be slavery, whether it be the Holocaust, whether it be, I mean, we can list hundreds of situations. And I'm like, I don't actually think that yeah. freedom of religion had a big relationship to the Holocaust, uh, but um, definitely, like, weird remark, uh, weird remark to be making, not, not, you know, but probably that's not going to happen yeah. most of the time. This, this is going to come right back up. and. I don't know if you saw, they, uh, you know, some, some people immediately went back to this baker and said, okay, we want you to bake, now we want you to bake a cake uh, for a, a, a transgender gender confirmation party. Yeah, exactly. Um, like a cake that was like, like pink on the no, inside, you know. blue on the outside, uh, which is like, a pretty clever yeah. cake design. Uh, and he says no, and then of course it's like, you know, all right, buckle up, like Master Speech Bake Shop 2 or whatever. Um, so yeah, we're going to get an answer to that, and I have a feeling I know what the answer is going to be. So, all right, uh, let's talk about the future. We've got uh, the court's term is starting in just a, just about a month now, first Monday in October, mm -hmm. uh, which means that uh, they used to, well, they used to call this, uh, you know, October term or whatever. So we, in the old days, we would have called this October term 2018. We will now call this season three of the Supreme Court uh, because it is season three of the podcast. Um, so what are the granted cases that you're sort of interested in, in the, on the sort of in the criminal law and criminal procedure world? So, uh, you know, certainly Thames versus Indiana, which is a case about whether the excessive fines clause uh, is incorporated onto the states by the 14th Amendment, which I just think it's so weird. How, how, like, we, we've been doing incorporation doctrine for decades and decades, and, th and then yeah. there are still some provisions that the court has never conclusively uh, answered the question about. And, you know, I taught criminal procedure adjudication last year, and my students were just confused by this. Like, how did, how is there not an answer? It's just like, <laughs> I don't know, they just never took a case. Yeah, and they're I know. finally going to do it. And it's a, yeah. it's a big one, too, yeah. because, like, you might think, well, the excessive, you know, the excessive fines clause, you know, who cares about that? Yeah. It's about civil forfeiture. Yeah. It's about asset forfeiture, right? So, like, Tim's, the other petitioner in the case, it's this guy, you name named, like, Tyson Tim's or something, and his Land Rover is the other petitioner in the case, as listed in the caption. Um, and, you know, the sort of question is, you know, is there any such thing as sort of an excessive forfeiture uh, that states do, you know, like, uh, so he was convicted of, like, some kind of rinky-dink drug stuff, uh, and they, like, seized his, like, $50,000 Land Rover, the connection of which to the crime was he used the Land Rover to draw, drive to buy the, like, opioids, um, and they're like, yep, that's ours now. Um, and so what he'd like to say is that is unconstitutionally excessive, but what the state of Indiana says is that's not a thing in Indiana law, right? Like, there is no such thing, so we don't even have to entertain whether this is excessive or not. I was surprised that they granted the case in a forfeiture case, right? Because it seems to me there's a difficult question there about, you know, is a forfeiture a fine for purposes of this constitutional provision? Yeah, well, apparently, I was curious about this, too, and apparently the answer for federal law purposes is is already yes, that there's already a sort of case that resolves that, because I agree, I was like, it's, 
if that move hasn't been yeah. made, you'd have to make them both at once. But apparently, if I was reading the petition correctly, that move is actually already there, so this is pretty clean. Um, so that'll be really interesting. Love an incorporation case. You almost never get those. The last one we had was like McDonald, right, about the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this will be fun. Let's yeah. we should, like, make and, a list of the ones we Justice Thomas has previously indicated some skepticism of civil asset forfeiture. So Yeah, but he's not exactly Mr. Incorporation either. So uh, we'll have to see. Um, well, he'd do, he do it through privileges or immunities. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's like this like totally eldritch theory that like no one else, although maybe he'll get Gorsuch yeah. and Gavin off of that. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe we'll just do the whole thing differently. Um, that one's pretty fun. Um, we've also got uh, a really, you know, there's a, the first death penalty case without Justice Kennedy, uh, yeah. Madison versus Alabama, uh, which is about, you know, the question in the case is interesting. It's about whether a person can constitution, whether it is cruel and unusual to execute a person um, for the commission of a crime that they can no longer remember because their mental health has badly yeah. deteriorated. The, the petitioner has, I think, vascular dementia, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it's important, it's interesting, you know, I don't know how many people yeah. as a practical matter it affects, but the really interesting thing about it is that, like, Justice Kennedy was, like, the guy on the Eighth Amendment for, a, like, quite a while. He drove that ship. And now he's not and there he anymore. He was very interested in carving out categories of defendants who couldn't be punished with particular penalties. Right. Know? Yeah, exactly. You know, so, like, people who committed Graham, the crime. You know, juvenile non-homicide offender. Yeah, exactly. Can't get life in prison. Yeah. And so now that he's not there, I mean, the, I mean, God, the lawyer for Madison, uh, upon Kennedy's yeah. retirement, she must have felt his heart drop yeah. because it's really hard. I mean, you know, Never say never, but a path to victory there looks very difficult, and I think yeah. that that's going to, you know, I don't know if they're going to roll back the Eighth Amendment stuff, but I don't think we're going any further. Yeah, although it, it is the kind of case where I could see maybe the Chief Justice saying, look, the case is already here. Gosh, this is going to look bad if we say, yeah, this is totally fine, and maybe he'll say, I'm going to apply I precedent and, you know, narrowly say this isn't permissible under these facts. Oh, man, if, if that happens... The overreaction level among conservatives to like, oh no, we've like the chief has suited us, will be like off the chain. Uh, it will be amazing to watch. That is not what's going to happen. The chief is very conservative. Um, so, what else do we have coming up? Uh, we also have Gamble, which is a case then in which the court is going to reconsider the separate sovereigns exception to the double jeopardy clause. Like these are situations where, um, you know, you're prosecuted uh, by a state government and then by the federal government, or vice versa, and whether the second prosecution is precluded by the double jeopardy clause. And that's long been established as an exception, uh, and it seems like there's some appetite on the court for rethinking that, mm -hmm. which you know could be significant. Um, that said, it sort of depends on what the underlying scope of double jeopardy doctrine looks like. There was another case from last term, Courier, where uh, Justice Gorsuch indicated that he thought the court should scrap uh, the so-called collateral estoppel doctrine of double jeopardy clause, mm -hmm. which suggests that if you're acquitted, they have to sort of look at the facts necessarily found in that acquittal, and then you can sort of use that as a shield in a future prosecution. If they get rid of that, the double jeopardy clause does not provide a huge amount of protection, especially in these separate sovereign situations, because it's really just going to be the Blockburger test, which just looks very strictly at this precise elements. Yeah. And in many of these successive prosecution cases, the crimes are subtly different. Even if they're coming off the <coughs> same facts, the formal crimes have slightly different elements, and then it's not going to be a double jeopardy violation. Right. And what I would wonder is, if they did that, would there then be pressure on the blo like hy further hydraulic pressure on the Blockburger test, right? Because right now, the Blockburger test doesn't do too much for the reasons you identified, but it's not that big of a deal because we have this other broader doctrine. And I could imagine, like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this collateral estoppel thing, and then we're going to think more clearly about what constitutes, like, the same offense. Because it's not, ob like, like, Blockburger is an easy test to explain, but it's not at all obvious why it's, like, clearly correct, right? I mean, you could imagine thinking about it differently, um, and so I would wonder if that would happen. So, um, yeah, that'll be really interesting. Is it your impression that the cases granted are kind of low stakes so far? I mean, I, there are not a lot of blockbusters on the docket for this term yes, yet. Yes, that, that is my view, because like, I've had people ask, you know, like reporters who are kind of, you know, call us up and write Supreme Court previews and stuff, and they're like, you know, what, what are the biggies coming up? Um, and my answer has actually usually been, well, among the granted cases, there, I, I'm not sure that any of them really constitute genuine biggies. I mean, they're interesting for lawyers, and you know, especially criminal defense lawyers and, and prosecutors, but uh, I think that sort of the biggies are yet to come, right? So you could example, for, uh, for example, you could imagine that like um, one of the DACA cases getting to the Supreme Court this term, because there's a bunch of these lower courts that have said that the attempted rescission of the uh, immigration order by the Trump administration um, was like invalid under like administrative law principles. You could imagine like that getting to the Supreme Court in time for them to hear it this term, uh, and that would be a big, you know, that would suddenly be, if that happened, that would instantly be the biggest case on the docket. Um, but I think part of it is 
they might not have wanted to, you know, grant a bunch of big stuff until they knew who their colleagues were going to be. You know what I mean? If you're the, you know, especially if you're like among the former liberal justices, and you're like, I don't know if, I don't know if Tony's going to be here anymore, um, and I'm not sure I want to like tee up. You know, I don't think Madison versus Alabama gets granted um, by because there's no split or anything. I don't think that gets granted if they didn't think Justice Kennedy was going to be around to hear it. So uh, they may have been waiting. Um, so yeah, not a lot of biggies yet. Anything else? Um, not, not a whole lot else that I'm excited about at this moment. Um, you know, there's some interesting issues sort of bubbling up in the lower courts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of interesting sort of criminal type or criminal adjacent issues uh, coming up there because I think it is an area where, you know, first of all, you know, some of these new uh, Trump appointed judges have sort of a conservative uh, ideology, but they have this originalist methodology. And that does uh, lead to some sort of places where you can sort of take positions that cut against what your politics would suggest. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing that are already happening to some degree with some of these uh, judges. So Judge uh, Thapar, a uh, new uh, nominee on the Sixth Circuit, um, just joined the court last year, uh, wrote a really interesting opinion uh, this week, sort of questioning the sort of structure of Fourth Amendment doctrine, mm -hmm. sort of questioning the CATS reasonable expectation of privacy framework and suggesting, uh, sort of consistent with, I think, what Justice Scalia had said at, at various points in his jurisprudence, yes. that we should be more willing to say more things are searches. Right now the doctrine says all sorts of things which are quite clearly searches as a matter of ordinary English language are not searches because you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And he says, you know, that just doesn't make sense. We should, you know, these things are clearly searches, right? If someone yeah. looks in your trash can to find your trash, they're searching something. Right. Maybe it's reasonable, maybe it's not. That's a separate question. Right, yeah, and, and what that really does is that that moves all of the action to, well, what does that mean you think about the so-called warrant presumption? Right, because like in Carpenter, for example, the chief could have said, um, this is a search of your location, but the procedures provided by the Stored Communications Act are constitutionally reasonable, even though they are not a warrant. He doesn't say that because he just invokes what is a, but you know, formally the doctrine, which is that a warrant is required unless one of the articulated exceptions to the warrant requirement exists. Now that, there are so many exceptions and that, you know, d rule is honored uh, so often only in the breach that it is fair to sort of say, like, you know, there's there's a lot more going on there. But yeah, because it's clearly true that, like, if any ordinary activity that constituted a search required a search warrant, policing would grind to a halt, right? And nobody is seriously going to go for that. And I guarantee yeah. you, Judge Thapar is not going to go for that, and definitely not Justice Kavanaugh. So then the question becomes, how do we figure out when you need a warrant and when you don't? Because you also don't want, like, open-ended balancing. Right, and so you could have a more, I think, you know, Justice Scalia's approach was basically a kind of like historical approach that like, you know, for example, a search of the home just always needs a warrant uh, because of, you know, kind of historical practice and tradition, things like that. How far does that get you with a cell phone? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, that is really interesting. I also and, noticed. And that's an area where I think Justice Gorsuch is definitely gonna be willing to sort of drill down to first principles with oh, yeah. some of his colleagues. Yeah. Based absolutely. on that Carpenter uh, separate opinion that, that you, know, you, you touched on briefly, we didn't talk about too much. Yeah, he wrote the separate opinion in Carpenter saying basically reanalyzing the entire case from like Fourth Amendment first principles as a matter of like history and kind of like throwing out all the existing doctrine in a way that really reads like he's about to vote for Carpenter to win and at the end says, but it'd be nice if any of you guys had put this in the brief uh, but you didn't, so you waved it, so I'm going to vote the other way. Uh, and it wasn't, ne wasn't necessary for the result, and I kind of wonder if he would have done that if it had been. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So the other thing that I think is interesting, and this is adjacent, I think, you know, because it involves, so often it involves police officers, so it's adjacent to criminal law, um, is uh, Judge Ouellette, Don Ouellette, uh, a judge on the Fifth Circuit, a former uh, ju justice on the Texas Supreme Court, the only federal judge, I believe, who tweets. Uh, actively. Um, he slowed down since he became a federal judge. He was a very active tweeter as a state court judge. Yeah, I imagine that basically he'll, he'll keep it slow uh, until he's like, he knows he's definitely off the, you know, possibility to be on the Supreme Court, uh, and then it'll go right back up to where it was. Um, so he uh, wrote an interesting sort of separate um, opinion where he did, he, he, one of my favorite things, which is, uh, he said, Don R. Willett, circuit judge, concurring dubitante. And I like when judges do this because you can write anything you want on that disposition line. It doesn't just have to say concurring or whatever. Like, this is your opinion. You can put whatever you want in there, right? So he says that basically um, questioning qualified immunity, right? He says, look, this is a, a, a case about this guy's rights that were violated, but owing to what he calls a legal deus ex machina, the clearly established prong of qualified immunity analysis. And in, in that opening paragraph, I counted maybe nine metaphors. Yeah, he says, he, he refers to kudzu-like creep, um, he refers to Sisyphean work, uh, 
He refers to entrenched judge-made doctrines. Kevlar-coded. Kevlar-coded, yeah. Tweak-level tinkering. And I'm like, okay, but th this whole thing is, that's one paragraph, folks. That's about eight lines. I'm like, just, you know, pick, save some of these for the next one, man, because now you can't say the kudzu thing again. That was pretty good. Um, oh, well. So, uh, and that's really interesting because uh, for two reasons. Number one, Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court has indicated that he too has some doubts about qualified immunity doctrine, that it has become too protective uh, of government actors. And if that, if that changed, that would be a seriously big deal uh, because it could, I could well imagine actually a world 10 years from now where qualified immunity is cut way back, but also the exclusionary rule, for example, is also cut way back, uh, which has been kind of like the conservative, you know, the, the sort of like thinking conservatives dream uh, when it comes to this stuff for a very long time, and might well be better, uh, for all I know. I don't, you know. It's hard to evaluate what that system would look like outside of it. But it was also interesting because I saw that uh, your friend and mine, Orrin uh, Kerr, sort of prompted an interesting debate on Twitter about, like, is this kind of concurrence, like, actually appropriate for judges to be writing? Where they say, you know, basically, I, I think this area of the law is, like, malconceived. I'll go along with it because I don't have a choice. I'm a lower court judge, but I don't like it. Yeah, Oren said that if a judge wants to criticize Supreme Court precedent, you should write a large article, but not do it in an opinion, in a judicial opinion. And I, d I didn't agree with that at all. And I think that, you know, maybe you don't want to do this every time, but why not concur once in a while and, and just say, look, by the way, Supreme Court, you should really th rethink this doctrine. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, and for reasons you might not be seeing. Yeah. And, it, and it's quite actually helpful, I think, to the court. For, so, for example, if a cert petition kind of comes up raising this issue, it's helpful to be able to say, look, judges put their name on this criticism, not just in you know, speeches at a, at a university or something, but like they publish this under their own name it, you know, via their court, right? Mm -hmm. That just adds a kind of seriousness to it that, you know, look, as, a, as professional publishers of law review articles, you know, God knows we love them. Um, but we also know that like, and also by the way, this is like a paragraph. And you can write a one paragraph concurrence being like, I'm not so sure about all this. Good luck submitting that in the like law review submission cycle, okay? You're going to have to build up about 65 more pages and about 500 more endnotes before you can publish that thought uh, in a law review. Like, not every thought is law review length, right? And so, you know, I'm sure the judges have an easier time of placement than you and I do, uh, but still, it ain't going to be that easy. So um, that's an interesting, you know, keep your eye out on that. Uh, that's, an, I think, an important development in the lower courts. And we're, it, it's, becoming a, it's becoming a very fashionable position among sort of like, you, you know, bright conservative intelligentsia, um, you know, academics and judges. It just has like, it, you know, it, it's like a, it has a cachet that I think is, you know, it's going to, we're going to eventually ha like have this one out at the court, I think. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I think we're going to have it out. So that's the shape of things to come.